It was eight months after my arrival in Canada from Iran. I leaned against the bare window, staring at the sky to escape my sadness. My mind was infatuated with thoughts of leaving, but my eyes could not follow any direction other than my own reflection trapped in the silence of the glass window. I remembered and forgot, reconciled and rebelled, remained silent and whispered to the empathetic ear of the room to preserve the dignity of my pain. With little interest, I stared at the wall-sized mirror in the dining room, the early afternoon sun making the boy's fingerprints obvious. I didn't care about wiping them out. In fact, from time to time, those fingerprints stood out like footsteps, racing after me, beating into my heart, reminding me of a path to hope and reason to leave. There should be a way out, I thought, when suddenly CJ moved through the shadow of the entrance door and then into the light. Look, Mom! With much pride, he showed me his little treasure, a planted green bean seed in a foam cup. For a good few minutes, he sat on my lap, leaning over me to talk about the miracle of germination from dried seeds. Can you imagine, Mom? Then he disappeared from sight, carrying on an argument with his younger brother, Belva. Yo, don't touch it. I felt that life was flowing through my dried veins and prayed to God for strength. I was stressed out in a superstitious way, lacking confidence to break through walls that forbade my independence. And yet, I saw my son so innocently waiting to end the uncertainty between a dried seed with a warm glow in his face. Like a protective ego, he would hover around as if a bean tree was about to grow in wonderland. He was living in a moment, yet waiting for a miracle to happen. His brother Belva was watching everything closely, but he stayed back, respecting a newly set boundary. It was not so much the phone call, but more so CJ's fascination with it, that had attracted his attention. Belva was almost two years junior. He was full of life, but an weird smear. The apprehensive CJ could not enter a new day, without caring before leaving for school. Don't come near it when I'm gone, CJ warned. I'm coming with you to school, silly ass, Belva yelled back at him, and then turned to his big head, seemingly too large for his skinny neck to hold, towards me, bitterly complaining. Ma, CJ is accusing me again. Shut, I was talking to Mom. CJ interrupted him like a toddler bone, and then softened his voice, asking me, I mean, do you think there is enough sun to nourish my big plant? Yes, my love, don't worry. His questions seem endless. I will take care of it. And then with a reassuring look, I escorted him to school. Going to school, however, was not a joy. He felt the stress of not being able to communicate fluently in English. You learn fast, CJ, his teacher Miss Martin said to him. She then whispered into my ear, not to worry, Miss Rupley, kids learn English in no time. I believed her. Her eyes and her gestures were genuine. Back in our apartment, CJ occupied himself with his science project, carefully observing and recording the growth of their fledging root. Watching CJ making meticulous rhyme reminded me of back home, where he would spend hours rhyming with his aunt Thera. He would sit in the middle of the garden, under the shade of plant flowers, paint flowers, my mother's fig tree, the little grey kitten, fearfully testing the boundaries of our neighbor's wall, my father's grapevine, hanging from a wooden arc he had built to impress my mother, and the swimming pool my brother once nearly drowned me in by accident. Copy me, CJ, copy this line. He couldn't, but he he would gumble about trying to amuse her. His aunt believed someday those little fingers that barely could hold her big wooden paintbrush would make a masterpiece. I don't know why, but I had the feeling that he wouldn't, and Farah repeatedly asked me to keep my opinion to myself, and that would end our conversation about art. Perhaps I imagined him to be a professional but I found her patience and CJ's persistence in trying fascinating. Years later, having his art supplies on the bare floor of our 
first diasporic home in Canada made me wonder if CJ would ever be able to see his aunt again. I could only imagine the unification through memories or photographs we had mailed each other back and forth. Mom, I had a dream about my being. CJ broke my train of thought. I saw green shoots breaking through the ceiling. For days, the green seat became the focus of our discussions, until one day he noticed a tiny bent stem emerging from the soil, bending towards the light. The child is fascinated with dormancy, germinating, and carefully watches from the beneath the clouds, embryonic roots celebrating their freedom feeding rebellious branches. The child patiently watches. Molly leaves dancing to the comb of sun winds. In his imagination, he sees and questions the meaning of a spring screen rising to life in his phone cup. Days overcome the secrets of ticking nights, and the child and the being search for sun to stream life into the veins of leaf knots. The strings grow tall, flower buds grow, bloom, and in silent mating, gently transform the elegant womb. The end is now a new beginning, a new beginning that pretends the end. It's time to harvest, child, son. It's time to harvest. As Sisi and Dabal occupy their role with the green bean, I already planned my separation from their father. I was about to seek refuge in a women's shelter. I married him at age 18 during the post-revolution tour. He was the first man to ever touch my hands, to kiss my cheeks, to look into my eyes as I blushed shyly, gazing back. But a few months later, I noticed that many nights I would lay awake staring at the ceiling or crying quietly. I remain in our marriage uncertain, keeping an optimistic tone to my inner monologue, the voice in my mind telling me love will eventually emerge and things will change. The Iran-Iraq war, however, closed all doors through which I hope to escape. Suddenly, I realized how our two sons were relying on me to grow though I barely trusted myself to survive unhappy marriage. I found myself in complete darkness, wondering, should I take lead? How could I let my children down? Should I stay with him, or can I tolerate him? From that point on, I accepted him the way he was, and accepted our relationship the way it was, nothing less, nothing more, and let the rules of marriage and parenting tie tie us to each other. We were in it together, he for convenience, and I out of desperation. He had the protection of family law, standing behind him like a trained army defending its patriarchal territory. If we divorced, the law would grant him full custody of our sons. The same or leaving seemed equally painful to me. And for this, at age 23, I felt very old in my marriage. I spoke about it with a few friends who day after day witnessed my anguish, but who gently reminded me this was a fact, a way of life. But deep inside, I refused to accept hopelessness as my destiny. The woman inside me was still striving to grow, to discover, and for that I decided to resist in silence. I resisted by mastering control over my thoughts or his threats of leaving the country with our sons and without me. I learned him and his anger. He was angry often about his job or me or our country. And I pitied how he had killed the kind man he could have been. He had lost the innocent, shy, respectful girl inside me, and he knew too little about the woman I was becoming. Now in Canada, I was ready to walk away knowing that I had legal rights to my sons, not anticipating other challenges awaiting me. It's a disgrace to break a marriage, he insisted, that I would not survive without him. 
Well, don't you see how unhappy we both are? I thought. He continued. For Christ's sake, think about our children. They will become drug dealers. You're going to turn them to garbage men. What's wrong with a happy garbage man? I replied. If those boys don't make it, it's your fault. I found no benefit in argument, growing impatient with delaying the separation plan. I was vulnerable, caught in the turning lumbers of my life, uncertain immigration status, limited knowledge of English, no means to support myself and my children, and no professional skills that would allow me to gain my independence. My most vivid memory of leaving my husband was leaving CJ's little green bean behind. I had seen him sowing the seed, nourishing it, and dreaming about its growth. Over the past ten days, we had gathered around the foam cup, observing the miraculous transformation of a dried seed into green life. Mom, I want to take my bean, CJ said. No, son, you can't take it. I knew I could not manage to carry our bags and safely hold CJ and Belba's hands. I was also worried that the fragile young plant would not tolerate the arduous journey. I did not want the boys to witness the destruction of the precious green living thing. As I gathered my bag, I walked sadly towards the bedroom and took the ring from my finger, carefully placing it. On, a, on my husband's pillow on the note I had written him. Like a butterfly breaking its cocoon, I emerged from the room and our marriage. Just before turning the doorknob, CJ ran towards the window. I immediately grabbed him, his arm, and pulled him towards the door. I want to take my bean, he insisted. Hurry, boys, we don't have time, I implored impatiently. I turned the key, the key in the doorknob and was and we departed from the memories of our first Canadian home. On the bus, as I leaned against the red violet sea, I reflected on my childhood. I missed my father. I wanted him to protect me from the unknown journey, or to shield me from further hurt. Why didn't he stop me from leaving Iran? Why did I need to seek safety in a place called shelter? I needed home. I had to change my train of thought. I could not blame my father for not being there. He had, a stop, had he stopped me from leaving Iran, I would have lost my children, and then my suffering would surely have been worse. My father knew his, this bitter reality and decided to endure the pain of losing his daughter over seeing his daughter suffering the pain of losing her sons. He sacrificed his pride as a protector of his family to ensure the survival of his innocent grandchildren. I was in grade two, and it was midday and hot when I brought home my little school project, the bean. I patiently waited for Friday to arrive, as it was the only day that my father was off work. He would spend much of his spare time playing with us. I surprised him that day with a fragile stem, shyly holding its leaves. With a deep, comforting smile, he looked at my happy face, cast another look at the bean, and said, let's plant it in our garden. My father enjoyed gardening more than any other activity. The yard had three gardens, represented with roses, delis, and herbs surrounding a small central blue pool. There was a large playground on the other side. I was quite chubby but often played hotchstock with my siblings or with my best friend, Marian. As I handed the bean to my father, I imagined my mother picking green beans to make beans and rice. With his index finger, finger my father dug a small hole, indenting the black soil. He then carefully removed the bean from its red plastic cup and placed it in the hole, then covered its roots with soil. He gave it a generous watering. There on the bus, thousands of miles away, in a strange new country, I suddenly felt ashamed for depriving my son of a similar joy. He was worried about abandoning his bean, and I was preoccupied with my departure plan. Suddenly, it occurred to me that I could have put the bean in my bag. It was too late to return home. I was frightened and had no bus fare. 
I withheld tears, not wanting the boys to feel my angst. There was no option but diving into our new beginning. The guilt of depriving my son of his creation haunted me, like the groaning floorboards of an old house cracking and cracking at unexpected moments. I mourn alone and try to bury my memories. One day, when CJ came home from law school after the Thanksgiving holiday, I finally broke my two decades of silence and asked, CJ, do you remember your little green bean? He gazed into my eyes with a strange look and said, Which green bean? The one that you had planted as part of your grade one science project. No, I don't. You mean you don't remember the day we left your father? Yeah, I remember that. Do you remember your green bean that we left behind? No, Mom, I don't. What about the bean? I thought you were upset with me for not taking it with us. If I was upset back then, that doesn't mean that I should remember or be upset now. He continued searching through my book collection. I concealed my feelings of guilt for over two decades only to discover that what I assumed to have been a significant childhood trauma had barely impinged on CJ's consciousness. But then, why was the green bean so significant in my memory? I had left the smell of the spring blossoms, the taste of green figs, and the sound of what vendors call for fresh watermelon after the afternoon nap. I left behind memories of chatting politics with women at the bakery while waiting my turn for hot bread from a stone oven. I left behind my past in search of a new future. I endured loss after loss, and yet I had to let go of something that my children cherish, the bean grew in my first home in Canada. I once again asked CJ, are you saying you don't remember the green bean to make me feel better? Mom, I just don't understand you. Should I be more upset with you for leaving behind my green bean? Or for not letting me trim the lawn when I was 15? Don't bring that topic again. I stopped him out of embarrassment. God knows why I didn't let the poor boy shave at age 15. He then gazed into my eyes for a moment. Then, with a smirk, he stole a copy of my book. He quickly disappeared from sight laughing out loud with his Aunt Farah in the basement. I want my book back, CJ, I screamed from the upstairs floor. Mm -hmm.